Thank you for coming uh, to this celebration of the visual arts. Um, it is really wonderful that the Yale Center for British Art has opened on a special Monday so that uh, we'll all be treated to an inspiring conversation on the history of exhibiting and collecting abstract art. I'm always reminded of a claymation film that maybe some of you have seen called Closed Mondays. And it's about these clay characters who go to the art museum on Monday and have a wonderful time with nobody there, no staff, no one watching them. Well, I am in no way implying that you are clay characters, <laughs> but I am suggesting that on Monday we can have a wonderful time at the Yale Center for British Art. So I know it was an incredible undertaking to bring together such remarkable members of our artistic community. And I thank the Yale Center for British Art, the Alumni Art League, the African American Cultural Center, the University Art Gallery, and of course the Yale Center for British Art for tonight's panel and for the reception uh, uh, afterwards. Um, this idea originated uh, in the Yale Alumni Art League. And uh, I think it was Miko McGinty and Nicholas Lewis who did a great job of uh, taking that idea and bringing it uh, to fruition. So uh, thank you, Miko. I know uh, Nicholas was called away to a family funeral, but um, uh, I really appreciate both of their work. So we're going to hear uh, discussions today about the history and experience of producing, curating, and collecting abstract art. And the panel will feature great artists and scholars, Kevin Beasley and William Williams, two exceptional artists who graduated from Yale's MFA program at the School of Art. Uh, Susan Kahn, our Dean for the Arts in Yale College. Pamela Joyner, a leading collector and philanthropist whose modern and contemporary art collection has reframed the art world's understanding of its own history. Courtney Martin, a scholar and professor at Brown University who received her PhD in the history of art from Yale. I should mention that Courtney is about to become uh, the deputy director and chief curator of uh, DIA Art Foundation. And so congratulations on the new position. So Yale has a long history of supporting art. We recognize that art collections can capture history and social change, and art can help start crucial conversations about our society. The students and faculty at the Yale School of Art have always contributed their voices and vision to such important discussions. Our courses in the Department of the History of Art are some of the most popular on campus. So I know that all of you tonight share an appreciation for the vital role of the arts. And uh, I thank you for being supporters of the arts at Yale. One of the great things about teaching at Yale, and I have taught in the psychology department for many years, three decades, is that we have this great teaching, these great teaching tools sitting right here on Chapel Street, on either side of Chapel Street in our art collections. And, uh, one of the things I used to do in my introductory psychology class was to send students over to um, either the uh, Center for British Art or uh, the University Art Gallery with assignments like, see what you can find out about the way mental health and mental illness were understood by looking at art. And they would come back, they'd discover something, and they'd come back with something to share with our class. And uh, so for me, it was always incredibly gratifying uh, that we had these collections uh, at Yale and they could become teaching tools throughout the curriculum. So I'm now happy to introduce Amy Myers, the director of the Yale Center for British Art. She is a wonderful leader, scholar, and teacher herself. Uh, she began uh, her work here uh, at the center in 2002, although she is a graduate of Yale's uh, doctoral program in history of art. Uh, she initiated the creation uh, of the center's conservation plan and guided this center through the completion of a three-phase building conservation project, the most comprehensive to date, really um, re-envisioning and bringing back to life uh, Louis Kahn's uh, masterpiece. Uh, she has 
significantly expanded the museum's role uh, as a leading research and as a leading educational institute in the history of art and in culture. And at the same time, she strengthened uh, the center's exhibitions and publications. Since uh, the center reopened last May, Amy has introduced the collections and resources of it to many new students and to our faculty. Uh, the center has seen a 30% increase in attendance as compared to the same period in 2014. So we're all very fortunate to have Amy uh, as our leader, and I would like to introduce her to you now, but probably someone who needs no introduction to this group, Amy Myers. Thank you, Peter, for that lovely introduction, and a welcome to all of you um, this evening. I would like to reiterate Peter's thanks to Miko and to Nicholas for organizing a very special panel. Um, additionally, we are deeply appreciative to Peter and to Marta um, for their support for this evening's excellent event as well. Tonight's program is supported by the Rhoda Pritzker Fund for Lectures on Modern British Art. And it is the second in a series of five honoring the great gift of Rhoda's collection to the center. That collection really um, sets us in new directions in underpinning our ability to collect modern art in very new and important ways. And evenings like this, I hope, will become much more common in our programming over the years to come. This evening, we also recognize the work of alumna volunteer Miko McGinty, who organized an exhibition at the center as an undergraduate, and in her professional life has designed numerous publications for our institution, most re recently Enlightened Princesses, Caroline Augusta Charlotte and the Shaping of the Modern World. Um, the exhibition of the same title is on view this evening in the second floor galleries, and given the importance of Women's Day, I think it apt that perhaps you take a look. Um, I think you'll find it to be a very important, important exhibition. Our modern and contemporary collection is mounted in our third floor galleries and is open to um, viewing this evening as well. I now am delighted to welcome back to the center, as Peter has indicated, Courtney Martin, Assistant Pur Professor and Art and, of Art and Architecture at Brown University, editor of Four Generations, the joiner Gafreda Collection of Abstract Art, and this evening's moderator. As a graduate student at Yale, Courtney was an active and beloved member of the center's community, working particularly as a research assistant on an exhibition entitled Art and Emancipation in Jamaica, Isaac Mendez Belisario, um, which was curated by Tim Berenger um, and Jillian Forrester, our senior curator of prints and drawings here at the center along with its associated publication to which she really made very important contributions in terms of her research. More recently, Courtney has contributed to British Art Studies, an innovative online journal published by the Center, and our partner institution, the Paul Mellon Center for Studies of British Art in London. We congratulate Courtney on her new position. We look forward to collaborating in wonderful ways with Dia under your stewardship. It will be an honor and a pleasure, but most especially this evening, we welcome you as the moderator for this superb panel, and I hand the evening to you. Um, well, Miko is setting us up. I would just like to start by saying that um, I, I became a scholar of 20th century art in this building and across the street from it. And so it is incredibly special to me to be here, particularly among friends, um, as I see them out in the audience. Um, I'd also like to thank Miko because not only is Miko an alum um, as I am, but she is also the designer of Four Generations, which I think is an amazing tome, mostly because of her wonderful leadership of it as both a design object and as upside a down. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> upside down or right side up. It's still amazing. <laughs> So I'd like to start, um, we're going to just do brief introductions so that we can um, 
really get to the meat of the day, and everyone here has so much to say and so much to offer. Um, I will start here with Susan Kahn. Um, Susan is, in addition to being here um, as an assistant dean in the Yale College, she is also uh, the author of Mounting Frustration, a book that still stands right now as my favorite book um, wow. out of art history for this year, uh, mostly because it's the only one that I've had time to read this year. <laughs> I'm, amazed. I'm amazed by how wonderful it is. Um, and I, I look forward to the ways that you will, will really give us more information about it, given that we also have William T. Williams here, who is included in the book. Seated next to Susan is Pamela Joyner, and Pamela, as you know, is the collector for whom this book was compiled. Her um, unparalleled collection of artists uh, who were working largely in abstraction is how I came to this project, but it is also what ties many of us together in this room. Um, I look here at our publisher, Greg Miller, whom I'd like to say hello to, as a reminder that we really came together as a group. All of the artists began to interact um, all of the writers began to interact because of both Pamela Joyner and her <coughs> husband, Fred Jafreda. So I would love to hear more about how that collection, um, its, its impetus as well as how it's expanded in the months since the book has merged. William T. Williams, um, the subject of one of our many strains of the conversation today is a 1968 graduate of the School of Art. Um, Williams is also the subject of a major solo exhibition that will open on April 7th in New York at the Michael Rosenfeld Gallery. So I invite you all to not only think about the work that is here, but also the work that you will get to see that spans a good portion of his career in just under a month. Um, I am wildly anticipating this exhibition, so I look forward to talking to you um, and having you tell us more about how this work had a genesis here at Yale. Um, and Kevin Beasley who has just recently come from the West Coast um, at an amazing show at the Hammer, will talk to us about more recent adventures at the Yale School of Art from which he matriculated in 2012. So please uh, join me in welcoming all to the panel. <laughs> Bill, I, I wanna start with you. Um, Partially because I want, I want to get a sense. I, I, I'd like you to put us into 1966 to 1968 in New Haven, um, a few, straight, few streets away on Temple Street, down the street um, on York. You know, what was the School of Art like between 66 and 68? What was it like for an abstract painter, specifically? Well, the, the school was divided into two camps. There were about five figurative painters, and most of the other painters were abstract painters. Um, most people were engaged in formalism, which was the uh, going fair for the department. Uh, it was exciting. It was um, challenging. Uh, there were a lot of very, very good artists in the program. And what generated, I think, the energy is you had 24-hour use of the studios, and most people were there 26 hours. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you had, you had this incredible energy that was going on, and most of the graduates that I came out with are still very good friends, and most of them have had long careers and are, are still working. And I, I suspect that Kevin will be part of that group as well <laughs> as his career goes on. You recently told me that when you came, that Al held held out his hand to you and said, welcome, I've been waiting for you. And that Jack Torcock, who was the chair at the time of the painting department, really pushed you. He gave you a reading list from the Rudolph Building. He said, get in there and just you know, start reading. Um, cool. is, is that what the department felt like to you at the time? Well, I was coming from Pratt, which okay. was an art school, so there was some background. Al held the day I got on campus, he was there, and he literally said, I've been waiting for you. Uh, the people who had written letters of recommendations were, uh, he was very familiar with. Uh, he liked the work, and within the week, he had given me a reading list that was impossible. It was just <laughs> not possible to do. And he would each week come and give me another reading list. <laughs> and he said, next week, we're going to discuss this. 
So I spent probably, oh goodness, a good five hours a day in the library. And the wonderful thing is in the, the bottom of the Rudolph building was the art library. So it was a situation where I was able to go into the library, catch up on what I needed to know, and then walk upstairs to the top floor to the studio to work uh, the rest of the time. When Bill was here, um, the School of Art and the School of Architecture um, had not split and were still one and were sharing the building then um, and sharing space. So there really was a, a more holistic understanding between the two disciplines and the library really glued them yeah. together. Kevin, did you have a similar experience? Were there people who thought of themselves as abstract painters in the way that Torkov and Held might have when you <coughs> arrived? I take it you arrived in 2010. Is that yeah. Okay. Um, not to my recollection in terms of um, falling under the label of an abstract painter. Um, I felt like the time that, you know, I was in the sculpture department, so I was on Edgewood, and <clears throat> I didn't go to the painting department that often unless it was to see friends or go to a crit. Um, and so there was a little bit of separation, um, but I felt like really the way that people's practices were evolving were around like urgency. Um, certain issues that I think uh, that the work could kind of speak to. So you had a wide range of what people were doing. I would say abstraction was a predominant way that people were approaching dealing with these kinds of issues or things that they were bringing up in their work. Um, but like one of my like most favorite painters was figurative painter. But I think that what was remarkable, or what is remarkable about her work, in particular Jennifer Packer, is the kind of um, the way that she handles paint, the abstraction within that when you focus in. So I think that there's a lot of um, the way that the sort of processes and techniques and the way that people are um, approaching certain certain subject matter, um, it's like a free for all. All of these things are are available. Um, all of these approaches are available. And the conversations are really tough and really hard because you have to sort of, in some way, justify to yourself first why you're doing what you're doing and then do that in front of others. Um, yeah, maybe that. Does that justification, you know, would you have described yourself as an abstract sculptor when you were here? Was that a part of the justification, or was, would you never have touched that terminology? Do you even call yourself a sculptor now, I should ask? A sculptor, yeah. Like okay. I, I'm, I'm deeply invested in, in what sculpture does for you know, space, for the body, for experience. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of um, abstraction, I think that that is the most sort of viable way for me to to deal with, um, I don't know, like <coughs> real, um, it's hard to find the language, you know. I think it's, you know, it's really important for me that my practice in the studio mirrors my experience uh, on the street, just, you know, interacting with friends, the way that I build relationships with people, the way that I think about context. And I think of abstraction is the way that my brain is kind of wired in the way that I see things. Mm -hmm. So I feel like I'm in some way trying to process these things through other forms that may not already be established. That in some way I'm trying to sort of investigate those things. Um, and, and yeah, and really try to create something out of that. Um, yeah, so I think like maybe I had more of an aversion to representation than I did a, uh, an approach to abstraction or, or one that would sort of claim abstraction. Mm -hmm. Phil, is that something that you, that mirrors your experience in any way? Did you, you came here at a moment when abstract art was visible in major museums, but it was also contested, right? Were, you know, were you having conversations with Tverkov and Held about a politic of abstraction that needed to define itself against figuration. And you also, you took art history courses. Was that a discussion that, that leaked out of the art school into the art history department across the street? Well, the discussion, abstraction versus figuration, was certainly going on. Um, 
the interesting thing is my background is mostly figurative teachers. Uh, like Katz, you? Perlstein, uh, Gabe Latterman. These were people who were, I mean, dedicated to the figure and have been and continue to be. So I had a, a kind of dual background in terms of having those skills to, to be able to do that. But having made a choice, I did not want to do that. Uh, there was no psychic place for me inside of figuration. And what I needed was a place that I could exist and a place that allowed me to talk about or speak to those kinds of issues about humanity. And figuration was not doing it for me, nor was formalism at that particular time. So my struggle in graduate school was, one, the body of information, the formalist uh, dialogue that was going on, uh, having to, to engage in that, but yet the work was pulling away from that more and more and more. Uh, the minimalist movement was not for me either. I was just, I was interested in the maximum movement as much as possible, mm -hmm. and overload, and kind of emotional overload uh, in the work. So uh, your question is uh, basically, it was a hard time for me, primarily because of what I was doing and the way that my approach to doing things. I was very conscious of that, that it would put me on the uh, outside. Uh, the political climate at that particular time, 1968, was one of um, the question of whether abstraction was viable, whether it had enough, whether there was any content, and whether it spoke to uh, Kevin's idea of the street or things that were going on politically in the country. Um, if you, for me it was the idea that a metaphor sometimes is much more powerful than an overt description of something. And a work of art, I think, has to exist over a long period of time rather than just being popular at a specific time. So the, the aspiration, again, was to make something that would last past that moment, past 1970, or past that particular kind of uh, expression that was going on in the art world. Mm -hmm. Pamela, do you, both Kevin and Bill are in your collection, and are also featured prominently in the book. Um, when you have looked at, at both of their works, I, I assume that you collected Bill first. Um, is that true? That's true, okay. yeah. And I assume then that in collecting Bill first that you were already interested in abstraction in some way. I mean, did you come to him and say, oh, wow, I just like this painting? Or were you, did you have a dedicated plan to collect an abstract artist? Well, I actually was very familiar with Bill's work long before I owned it. And um, I really, you know, absolutely fell in love with the work. What no flat image tells you about Bill's work, I mean, especially that body of work and then the subsequent series, is this notion of the maximum. Because, um, first of all, um, you know, we really endeavor to collect work that is critical, right? Work that changes the conversation and work that will endure. So that's one baseline. Um, and so, I look at that work and I say, it is a game changer. But what's not obvious from those reproduced images is the feathering and the <coughs> detail. Um, and I mean, I find them, I find that particular aspect of the practice, I find it romantic. I find that it is ev thought evoking. I mean, it just is, um, it's just a, mes Bill makes mesmerizing work. So, um, but by the time I was able to, to acquire uh, Bill's work, we were really on a particular path to focus on abstraction. Although, I mean, it's, cl it's clear from the slides, we will depart from that narrative in some ways as well because um, we're a private collection, not a museum, we can do what we want, right? So, <laughs> so, so we're drawn to what we're drawn to. But, but we the discipline is um, uh, a focus on abstraction and I actually, see, um, I can make an argument that Bill's work is in direct dialogue with Kevin's work, which the work we own of Kevin's is dense using Kevin's language, but it has a multi-layered, multifaceted density, and it is also mission critical. Mission critical, wow. Mm. I feel like um, we should all be in, in white gloves. <laughs> 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 you ready to get to work? Um, 
how then do you describe the rest of your collection relative to how you do have artists of genera different generations in the collection? Do you, do you now say to yourself, I would like to see every single painter, I would like to see every single sculptor that is doing X, or do you still, are you guided by a feel? Like is it, does that have something to do with the way that you approach this work? You know, I wish I could consume everything that's out there uh, and digest everything that's out there, but, but I can't. Um, we do have, I mean, we're just drawn to certain, a certain kind of aesthetic. Um, we love what we love, and we're always aspiring to go deeper in what it is and who it is that we love. So, I, I mean, we have both um, tensions going on in the collection. Um, and the only way to, to um, reconcile you know, both of those um, intuitions is to try to do um, what my MBA training requires that I do, which is to make a plan and make a budget and make a target and try to stay, you know, color within the lines. That's a Harvard um, plan, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> that is, sorry, it's a, Har it's a Harvard, that's a Harvard plan. Um, but, I always, but I always step outside of those parameters, but we do try to establish parameters. <laughs> Hope is not a plan. <laughs> Your True. collection is particularly rich in uh, mid to late 1960s work, and this is really the, the jumping off point in some ways for, for your book, Susan. Um, how did you get to that period? What, what drew you in? I have um, a copy here of Mounting Frustration, which is excellent. Thank you. To say. Um, you take us through a history of abstraction, but you do so not in, I think, the conventional ways, meaning that you approach this book through case studies, so it is arguably a book that is along the exhibition histories model yeah. as well. Um, but luckily for us, you are using exhibitions that have not been studied extensively, nor have they really been uh, teased apart to understand their nuance. Um, tell me how you get to this project, and why is it so rooted in this moment in the 60s? Yeah. Well, the late 1960s and early 70s were a period in which museums changed dramatically. Um, you could even say, which is what I argue in the book, that it was a period of transformation that marked a new era, and an era that we are now a part of. It was an era um, uh, ushered in by artists who had been excluded from the major museums, who wanted in. Um, primarily uh, uh, artists of color, African-American artists, women artists, and it was a period in which museums were re-examining or forced to re-examine the basic premises upon which they had been founded and the basic constituencies which they envisioned themselves serving. And um, so I was drawn to that period in a way because it was a cliff. And I, you know, and I, I've been giving book talks for the past year, but I've actually never really thought about it in this way until just this moment, that there was a, a history written of the Museum of Modern Art that came out, I think, in 1971 called Good Old Modern by Russell Lines. Many of you are probably familiar with it. And there was a, a history of the Metropolitan Museum called Merchants and Masterpieces, mm -hmm. uh, which also came out right around 1970, 1971. And um, th both of those books end with this uh, a statement of uncertainty, that museums are somehow hanging in the balance, that their relevance is being called into question, um, their, their uh, honorific place in society is being called into question. And so I think on some level, I was challenging myself to pick up the gauntlet and really look at you know, what that transformation was during those years. Um, and, and the transformation, the main transformation, um, I think, uh, was the main transformations were twofold. Um, one, um, at, during this period when various constituents were um, uh, engaged in processes of trying to gain entree into the museums, um, there were some successes and there, were, were, uh, there was some lack of success, uh, lack of sustained engagement with constituencies of color. And one uh, parallel development was the creation of culturally, what we call culturally specific or culturally grounded museums. And those museums um, still exist. And some have become very important. For example, the Studio Museum, which Bill was involved in, in founding back in 1968. And uh, 
this system that we are now a part of, it didn't exist before the early 1970s. It came into being during that period, and yet in our own era, um, we, I believe most of us who are in the museum field, see this as normal. Um, and the other big shift is that museums began taking their public role and their engagement with broad audiences much more seriously than they had before. Um, prior to this period, the visitors to museums would have been fewer and much less diverse. And um, uh, um, museums were more like temples um, than educational institutions. And so this redefinition of the museum as an educational institution really came about in the early 70s. Uh, coincidentally, um, I happened to be a teenager in the 1970s. <laughs> and, <laughs> and that's when I um, had my first involvement in museums. I did a high school apprenticeship at the Metropolitan, and, um, and that was my first exposure. And so when I began uh, delving into this history, I was passionately interested in understanding the period that really um, shaped and gave form to the institution that existed when I began and entered the field. One of the best things that I think about Susan's book is that um, as you read through, you realize that if you were going to write a new kind of art history um, about this period or really any other, that your primary sources have to shift <laughs> dramatically. Yes. And yes. one of the things that you really rely on that um, you know, I think as art historians we've all used to some degree, but there is, you know, there are no rules for this. Yeah. Um, I often tell my graduate students that I have never been asked to, nor will I ever be asked to sign um, the human subject agreement that if I were working in sociology I would have to do. And yet, you know, I interview artists like Bill, like Kevin, all the time. Yeah. And there is no protocol between us. There's no uh, you know, record of decorum. There yeah. is no standing agreement that I will not you know, in any way trespass that relationship. One of the things that I thought was the real strength of your book was that you, know, you do take on uh, the words of yeah. artists like Bill Williams. Yeah. Um, what was it like? working with him and talking to him about that period, <laughs> as well as talking about his art. What was it like for you, Bill? Maybe you want to go. <laughs> well, yeah, what was it like for you, Bill? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, was, I was just kind of amazed that this person, um, I think it was a lecture at NYU when we first met, and she came up to me and introduced herself. And yeah, it was at the Here Now conference. Yes, yeah. within <laughs> 10 words, she said, can I interview you? And I was so taken back by that, you know, in terms of someone, one, wanting to do it, but also that um, she knew my name and had an interest in doing it. Uh, the interview was, was um, it was interesting. <laughs> uh, because, you know, her, her interest is slightly different than my interest as an artist. And she forced me to think about things in the context of what she was interested in. Um, I'm still kind of digesting her quote in the book a little bit, but... Uh, Should we read it? Should we read it? Please don't. <laughs> no, 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 don't, don't do that. Um, it's not a sermon, so... No, yeah, it's, no. But, but, uh, can, you know, it's, it's always, a, for me, speaking with art historians and people that are on the other side of the thing is always interesting because it's, it's word-based. And as a painter, uh, painting is not word-based. It's, it's about the tactile, it's about, uh, it's a sensuous world. And it's very difficult to find the words to talk about that sensuous world that painting is about. Um, I think when I go to the museums and look at paintings, it's probably mm -hmm. different than what the curators are looking at or what art historians are looking at. Um, I tend to be, want to be six inches from the painting you know, the guards go crazy when I, when I do it. But I'm, I'm more interested in, in the kind of what the artist did, what's under, what's over, the kind of sensuous movement, the consistency of the paint. That has been my, my involvement. Now that's slightly different than a sculptor. Um, uh, when Kevin talked about the space before and how it exists and the body relationship to it, it's, it's, a, it's a kind of different experience. Can yeah. I just respond to that for a minute before? Because the thing that really um, was so powerful to me about talking with you is the way in which you took me into your experience and the way in which you, you, you talked about your, um, your aspirations and your uh, accomplishments and your 
um, struggles as an artist uh, in, in, in the confrontation of materials and in the application of materials. And, and I was laughing when Courtney first asked me the question because I interviewed Bill, I actually interviewed Bill twice. Um, the first time, when I went to transcribe the tape, I discovered that nothing had been recorded, oh, wow. which was a tragedy, but that was okay because it gave me an opportunity to go back. And when I went back, um, I brought a group of students with me. I was teaching at University of Missouri St. Louis at the time, and we did a studio visit um, with Bill where he generously you know, talked about his development as an artist and showed the students uh, all kinds of work from all different <coughs> periods and, and, and shared with them what it meant for him and the stakes for him as an artist. And, and I think that for my students to hear to hear you talk with such intensity about your process was a revelation for them. And I think that it enabled them to understand that the seriousness of what it means to make decisions as an artist, that there are no default settings, that every decision has to be made and that every decision is in some way going to affect the viewer's experience of that work and is going to have impact on conscious levels and on unconscious levels, visceral levels and um, you know, uh, physically. So um, uh, it was great to be able to interview you twice. <laughs> Sorry, Kevin. Thank you, Courtney. <laughs> Thank you, Court. So Pamela, um, would you be willing to tell us a little bit about your interaction with artists in a kind of one-on-one -on -one relationship? I think that you know Susan and I sit on the art historical <coughs> side. We, we also sit a bit on the critical side. Bill and Kevin sit, you know, as artists. Um, even though Bill has also written, um, you know, as the collector, I don't know where the there's not a boundary for you either. Right? And I th but I think actually you've explored the spaces that the collector is allowed to explore to great depths. Um, tell us about the ways in which you go about having one-on-one -on -one relationships with artists. So that's um, you know, sort of a multifaceted phenomenon. I won't say that it's a process because it's, it's organic. It happens how it happens. I'm actually in my third reading of Susan's book. Um, and it, that, that's in part because you know, the collection is um, really, it does have its genesis around um, the generation of artists working abstraction, working in abstraction uh, of which Bill is one. And I don't know if you remember this, Bill, but it must have been about eight or nine years ago, Mary Schmidt Campbell had a breakfast at her house. And you were there, Mel Edwards was there, and was it Jack? Or was it Sam Gilliam? There was a third person there. I think it was Sam. It was Sam. And um, this, what was so striking to me about that conversation um, was the repartee between everyone. It was very clear that these were you know, professionals who had great regard one for the other, though they work in very, very different ways, and that they have had decades of interaction that still are ongoing to this day. And in some ways, that was sort of the genesis of the way I thought about this book. It actually began to materially inform how we collect, because now we actually look for artists who are connected one to the other within their generation. So uh, you mentioned Jennifer Packer. I think that's really interesting that you have a dialogue with her and an interest in what she does, although what you do is very different. Um, and so I think it's perfectly fine for artists to work singularly by themselves in a room with no human interaction, um, but that tends to be not what we collect because we are an activist <coughs> collection. As you mentioned, Courtney, our mission really is to try to bring forward what Susan points out in her book and help to um, you know, institutionalize the reframing of a particular aspect of art history. Uh, and so getting to know artists personally is really important for us. It's hard, it actually does impact your ability to maintain objectivity about the art. And I'm okay with that because, you know, Kevin just was at our residency in Sonoma and the art is standalone and it's spectacular, but part of my interaction with Kevin and Golnaz and too much wine on a Saturday night in my <laughs> husband's wine cellar 
gives me insight about what the art is, where it comes from, where it fits, um, and so that's really important. So we, we, we enjoy getting to know artists personally, um, and we really started getting serious about the collection about 15 years ago when we got to know Richard Mayhew seriously. Um, and that's just informed our process ever since. When I first met you, Pamela, uh, you had so much art history knowledge. Um, you had this great library, you were constantly talking to me, and I kept saying, you know, I get paid for this. Um, you know, we just can't talk art history all the time. I have downtime. <laughs> but one of the things that I thought was so interesting was that once you told me where your art history came from, I realized this is what was different about it. This was actually what was interesting. That Pamela and Fred, her husband, had really been influenced by Richard Mayhew, a painter, who said, these are the books that I've read. This is how I approach painting. These are the skill sets that I have. Um, this is the way in which I go and look at institutions. And that was, you know, that's fairly radically different to be, in a sense, you know, you were trained in the atelier, and yet you didn't learn to paint, you learned the history of painting in that way. And I think yeah. that that's still fairly intact in many ways in the way that you talk about about art. Yeah, no, I mean, we really approach it exactly in that way. And also in part because while there have always been curators or art historians who were knowledgeable about uh, African-American uh, artists and artists of African descent, you couldn't dial 1-800 um, art advisor in this area. There weren't people specialized uh, in this area. So we had to cobble together our own resources. Uh, and they came from all over, but they, they mostly came from interacting directly with the artists uh, who had, you know, just treasure troves of stories. I mean, for, for instance, Dawood Bey is someone who I think an art historian could spend years with because he just knows so many stories uh, that I think have not been recorded. And so um, it's, the interaction is just very important for us. Dawood Bey is an interesting person in this context as well because he is a graduate of the art school from 1993 and though he has largely been photo-based, he is also someone who records by either his photographs or his previously his text, but now his blog and his web page, the goings on of other artists regardless of, of media. So there is a way that you're absolutely right that to know Bay is not necessarily to be interested in photography, but to be interested in a wider spectrum of art and artist. Kevin, tell me, um, have you read Susan's book? And this is not a test. We don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> I'm just wondering if, if this history in any way affects you um, in the same way for, for those of us here who have lived it to some degree or who are actively researching and writing about it. Um, I haven't read the book. Um, you should, though, yeah. I need, I need <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll pay you later, Courtney. <laughs> um, well, I think, you know, in lot, in like all the time, like I feel like I'm able to sort of reap the benefits of a, of a lot of the sort of work that's been done during this time. You know, op, like one of the biggest is, is Bill starting the Studio Museum studio program. Like I'm a beneficiary of that and I'm still reaping benefits from that time there. And I think that um, you can't avoid, as a black artist, you can't avoid those kinds of uh, or, or ignore the, uh, the history that has sort of led you to, you know, one, enter into an institutional collection or to be able to engage with the kinds of curators that you want to be able to engage with who are doing biennials, who are traveling all over the place and, you know, putting your work in the context of other people's work, both, you know, generationally and then with your peers. Um, I feel like it's, uh, it's, it's vital to actually consider those things um, because, you know, when I think about the space or the context, for instance, um, the work is, you can't avoid the history of the way that the space has been now, the way that the space has been used. Um, just as an example, the, the, the work that I just recently did for the hammer is in part considering the fact that the architecture was constructed for Da Vinci Codex. So thinking about my own practice and the conversations that happen in my studio relating to, you know, uh, high Renaissance sculpture, um, Bernini and Baroque, um, and then 
taking the kind of social issues within, you know, LA, within San Francisco, and sort of collapsing all of that into one space um, is so much about the kind of work and, and the possibility in being able to do these things in these spaces um, when given an opportunity to do it. Um, so in some way, I think that my practice, very specifically, is always trying to sort of mine some aspect of uh, a, a certain social history that I'm interested in, that I'm constantly indebted to, um, but then also find uh, where my, my direct relationship is to that. Um, so bringing aspects of my own life, my own practice, and my own approach into that conversation. Um, yeah, I don't know if that really gets to, <laughs> to the book, but I... But I, I I feel like um, this conversation would not be complete unless I uh, also told my um, Bill Williams anecdote. Um, I have I have three, but I'm only I'm only sure one. So the the second time that I met Bill was the first time that I interviewed him, and I actually went um, because I wanted to talk to him about another painter, but I really wanted to hear him talk about the whole period, um, and that painter was Frank Bowling. Um, Frank Bowling, who is a British artist, he is really, you know, the standard bearer, I think, for the modernist cat canon of 20th century British art. Um, but in some ways, strangely enough, he is, he links many of us together here. Um, Bill is a friend of Frank's. Uh, Frank is a, um, an artist that is in the collection of the Joiners and the Jufredas, and he is someone that Susan mentions in her book, but he is also someone who had come here um, as a critic. Uh, in the 60s and 70s when he was living in New York, not in London. Um, here we are in the middle of the Yale Center for British Art, and I just wonder if we could talk a bit about that um, Anglo-American exchange by, by way of someone like Frank. Well, Frank, one, Frank is a terrific painter. Um, when I met him, I guess, 1968, uh, his studio was two blocks below mine. Um, Frank knocked on my door one day and introduced himself, and we became kind of friends thereafter. Um, he had a very different approach. One of the things that was remarkable about the work is the light in his paintings was unlike any light I have ever seen in a painting. And I took that to mean, because he was from South America, that he had experienced light in a way that I never had. Um, he was generous to loan me a painting one day, I was in his studio, and I said, Frank, I really, really like that painting. Can I take it home? And he said, sure. Mm. And I took it home, and it stayed in the studio about a year and a half. And one day, he knocks on the door, and he says, I want my painting back. <laughs> I want my painting back. Get more British ways. <laughs> right. <laughs> and uh, what I learned from the painting about Frank, uh, he had a wonderful touch in terms of the application of paint. He had an extraordinary eye for color, and he was undoubtedly one of the great British painting painters of that generation. And what was on top of that um, was this ability to write about contemporary art. Um, his writing was wrong, and I say that, uh, uh, what I mean by that he was writing from a very, very British perspective about American art. And he was writing from a artist from Guyana who went to England and then to this country with that as a, as a context also for his writing, which was very different than my perspective and an artist that he was writing about. But the importance of the writing is because of that, because of his perspective coming from that background and our perspective in terms of making the art. He was really vital during that period in terms of um, his insistence upon a certain kind of art. So, Do you buy that, Pamela? So I, I actually, I, I can't address the question of Frank's writing, because I haven't read a lot of Frank's writing. Um, but um, I would agree with Bill's assessment. And this actually is making me think, you know, in some detail about what we do. 
Um, we own Frank fairly deeply. Frank is one of the first uh, artists we bought in the collection. Um, we own each of the major four series that he has worked in throughout his lifetime. And even though the visual of Bill's work versus Frank's work versus Sam Gilliam's work is all very different, they have a through line for me uh, in terms of what we find to be attractive about the work. We like people who are great colorists. Bill is a great colorist, Sam is a great colorist, Frank is a great colorist, Richard Mayhew is a great colorist. Um, Frank's paintings I would categorize overall as rougher, Bill's are more refined, Sam's are more um, um, sporadic, um, but the, the understanding of material, materiality, and the sense that the material is evocative is a through strand in all of the work. Um, so, I mean, I mean, this is interesting for me to hear myself say, because, I mean, I could probably, you know, go through now half a dozen or ten other painters that are in the collection. Um, and I would say these, they are the standard bearers for what it is we find compelling from an aesthetic point of view. Kevin, by the time that, that I arrived here and then you arrived here, the idea of uh, the Britishness that, that Bill describes, which I think is absolutely on point, had, I feel in some ways like it had kind of, um, you know, dissolved a right, bit, yeah. you know. Um, Lynette Yadam Boache is represented by a painting upstairs in this building. Mm -hmm. Isaac Julian, the filmmaker who is in Pamela's collection but, it, but had also <coughs> visited this campus and whose work had been shown um, at the Yale uh, University Art Gallery. Um, Sonia Boyce, another British artist, had been shown here. Yinka Shonabare um, just had an exhibition here inside uh, the BAC in the last year. You know, I don't know anymore if you and I necessarily recognize those artists as British with a capital B in the same way. Mm. Do, you, do you immediately go upstairs and see Lynette's painting and think British, or do you just you know, see painting? Yeah, I just see painting, like very transformational painting. And a time too when, like, you know, when I was in school, just, you know, to, to paint and to, you know, so like, so the art school, for instance, it's distinctions between departments. And this was my experience. I don't know how it's sort of evolved now. But I remember the dean, Rob Store at the time, explaining to everyone very specifically why the distinctions were important. Um, and the distinctions in, you know, there, at a time, too, when, when graduate programs are sort of putting all of these departments, just kind of throwing everyone into one pool, um, and you sort of learn from different kinds of people. You could have someone who works primarily in video come into your studio and be your advisor if you're a painter, um, and these kinds of things. But at Yale, it, it was really sort of specific that the heads of the departments were deeply invested in, in these kind of declarations, um, not as like a dogmatic thing, but more as uh, an educational approach that if, if you were a painter and you declared yourself a painter, that you could go directly into your part, the department and you could have a very critical conversation about painting, about the history of painting, and you knew that there would be someone in your department that you could carry that conversation with. And that was the same thing in the sculpture department, the same thing in photography, same thing in graphic design. Um, and I felt that, that that was kind of the sort of overriding conversation was how people sort of identified with the mediums that they were choosing. So if you were in the painting department and you were doing something more sculptural, one, you had a smaller studio than the sculpture students. So it was, it, it was, it was proven to be difficult to be able to, to make the kind of ambitious work that a sculpture student would be able to make. Um, but y you then would face criticism and, and, and constructively in all of these different ways. And that would happen in the sculpture department, people who would choose to paint um, very specifically to make paintings. That that conversation would then, you would have to sort of, you know, uh, you would have to like stand to the test or something. Um, but I think that that made 
this, this idea about everything that you do uh, is a decision made that more, it made that more apparent. And so the way that people you know, were working was um, these decisions were very conscientious. And if you weren't, then someone was going to hold you accountable for that. Um, so I, th yeah, so I, yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's funny. I arrived here today, and the first thing that I wanted to do really speaks to that kind of sense of being held accountable. Um, recently, Yale acquired and installed a mural by Odili Donald Odita, who is also in um, the Joyner Jafreda collection. And I wanted to go and see it because I felt as if this was not only a statement about a great painter. Um, I hope that you all have gone to, to see this mural at Ezra Stiles College um, and that you will continue going back uh, to see it. But I also felt like it was, it was Yale making a real statement about painting, about abstraction, about um, where we stand with artists uh, across the world at this moment. And I wonder if Susan, who has seen this probably far more than any of the rest of us on stage here, if you really, mm -hmm. if this feels like something that you are holding. Yeah. Um, to heart, yeah. Absolutely. Um, and I think Nico can put, it up, an image put up a slide. Um, and I actually made some notes um, so that I could also share with you all some of uh, Odili, Donald Odita's ideas. Um, I think that you know we've been talking mostly about the late 1960s and the early 70s, and that was a time period in which there were a lot of um, uh, arguments about abstraction. Um, it was very contested, and arguments about what abstraction was, what its potential was, was it over, um, arguments about the relative merits of abstraction and figuration. And I think that during that time, um, certainly in the dominant popular discussions, abstraction was viewed as something that had a certain kind of uh, abstract paintings, had a certain kind of internal coherence, that they were universes unto themselves. And there were ideas that had been inherited from uh, uh, decades earlier, ideas in high modernism that had to do with um, painting distilling itself down to its purest essence and distilling itself down to, and for those of you who study art history and, and art, this, these are very familiar ideas, um, that painting distilling itself down to the qualities that are intrinsic to the medium itself and kind of purging it of uh, itself of everything else. Those ideas were inherited from Clement Greenberg and popularized um, in, you know, throughout the 60s, 70s, and even into the 80s by Hilton Kramer, uh, the chief art critic at the New York Times. Um, and so I think that abstraction now, as we're talking about it, is something quite different. Uh, it's a much more open field. Uh, I think you know, everyone who's, who's talking about it here is, is talking about it in, in a way that has, uh, uh, is coming from a place of um, much greater freedom uh, rather than constraint. And um, Odili, Odita's work uh, is, I think, astonishingly, um, uh, it's a gift an astonishing gift to the Yale campus, not a literal gift, <laughs> but it's a gift to the Yale campus. <laughs> That's a <different> right. <laughs> because of the way that um, Odili's vocabulary as an artist uh, interacts so specifically with the site in which the piece was made. And um, Nico, can we see the slide of Ezra Stiles College? Okay. So what you can see here is it, it's a, a, um, a wall painting that is in two parts, and it um, it has a. Can, there's another. You didn't bring that one. Okay. So uh, the piece is abstract, um, but it but it doesn't have a strict geometry, and it has a very varied palette, but it's not a prescriptive palette, and it's not a predictable palette. Um, Odili was very uh, interested in the uh, theories of color interaction of Joseph Albers, which, as you, you all know, who was the director of the design department here during the 1950s. Um, but is, uh, so he, he's interested in how colors interact with each other optically and experientially, but not necessarily in a systematic uh, approach to color. Mm -hmm. um, Odili is also very interested in and was influenced by the work of Salouet. Um, a wall painter, very well known to Yale. Yale has probably one of the largest collections of Lewis' work in the world. 
And the sense that the color in this piece gives the piece a certain vitality, but is always held by the form, is one of the, um, uh, one of the characteristics that I think um, makes it both dynamic and present in the moment, as well as having a certain kind of monumentality. Um, and the monumentality of the piece, uh, to me, resonates very strongly with the architecture of Ezra Stiles College. Um, and if I may, can I just read to you a little um, of Odili's words? Um, he says, he said in developing this piece, I wanted to address the particulars of this building and to add to an ongoing process of opening out to the community at large. The skylight windows, and that renovated area in the common room has beautiful skylight windows, were a significant aspect of consideration for my designs, which counters the initial feeling of enclosure fixed within the monochromatic coloring of dark wood found in the front of the building. The skylight windows were simply stunning in presence and purpose. I came to understand the structural intentions of the skylights as a passageway, adding natural light into the common room and allowing the energies from the interior of this building to move outward and commingle with life in the surrounding rubble masonry pre-Gothic exterior of Ezra Stiles. Okay, up ultimately the design drawing and color of my wall painting was made to give force and reason to this idea of rising upward and outward. So Odili was very conscious of the fact that this is a room used by young people. It's a room where people do different things. They study, they hang out, they socialize. Um, he was very conscious of Yale a College campus as being a transient site where people move through the space. They don't live there forever. They come, they're temporary residents, and then they move on, in his words, you know, upward and uh, outward. And he, I think, was very conscious of wanting to create a piece that was going to have um, ongoing interest mm -hmm. for people who would see it literally every day. Mm -hmm. yeah. Susan, I, I can't believe you brought us full circle to be able to both consider um, contemporary abstract painting and perhaps also Ruskin. Um, that's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe this is the moment that we open um, our closed conversation to our audience here. I'm sure that, that I'm not the only person that is bursting with questions. So please. I think that we have microphones that are coming down on either side. So if I may ask you to wait until the microphone reaches you, just signal if you'd like it. If not, I'm happy to call. <coughs> on names, and I, I know several in the audience. Interesting what people are interested in. Um, Mr. Owen, I want to congratulate you on the appointment to the Getty Museum. Oh, and, thank you. Uh, how did you go about getting that appointment? <laughs> um, you know, the, the director whom I've known um, tangentially for a number of years, uh, along with his board chair, rang up and invited me. Um, and, um, you know, I had to, I, I'm involved in a lot of institutions and I sit on a lot of boards and I, I'm not known for having a, a lot of free time and I did have to study it. Um, and uh, after meeting a number of the board members and spending some time with the staff, um, it became clear to me uh, the extent to which the Getty, particularly in its research capability, is a world-class institution. And the board felt that some of the things I'm interested in could augment their activities in that, that specific area. Uh, and I'm one, again, hearkening to you know, this MBA training. I need a job description. And so when I got a job description that I liked, I decided I would join the board. Linda, I'm sure you have a question. We have one here. Okay. Thank you very much for that. Um, I really enjoyed it. And I'm very interested in, um, Kevin, that you made a reference to scale as being a factor in um, just how studios might be allotted. <laughs> um, and I wondered if all of you from your different perspectives might speak to how just scale um, factors into how you see these works. Um, I don't know, playing into what you choose to collect or how you choose to represent or think about how abstraction 
um, fits your goals expressively? Um, well, I mean, it just strikes me that a lot of the work that's being made today by contemporary artists, um, it's big. Um, you know, some of the pieces that we own of Kevin's um, are monumental. I'm not sure how they're going to fit into the space that we have to offer. One, we just a commission we just installed uh, two weeks ago. My husband told me we would never move. I'm glad I wasn't there to witness it. Um, we hung it from the ceiling. Um, Kevin and five other guys needed to move this work that I think is the largest single piece of work yeah. you've ever made. It's nine by 14 feet. Yeah. Um, and it is monumental. But I, um, but I do say, and there's not necessarily a direct correlation be, between size and the notion of work being iconic, um, but we really do endeavor in our collecting efforts to find whether the work is by a young artist or a very senior artist, we're really looking for um, things that are iconic within the context of that practice. Um, and in today's world, a lot of that is large. My question is for Susan, as Dean of the Arts, uh, is Ezra Stiles the abstract college? And does the nature of the uh, Yale colleges have so much art in them all around campus, does that affect student life in any way? I don't know if it affects student life. Yes, it does. Tell me how. It tell, does. tell all don't this you, stuff. Don't you think so? Having an abstract piece? Having art in general. Oh, having art. Oh, my God. Having art uh, no, no, no. around cake. Oh, well, yeah. I mean, so um, there are a lot of really exciting artists. I mean, okay. In my dreams, <laughs> Morrison Styles would be galleries. I mean, they're so, <laughs> right? The spaces are like so incredible that. Um, you know, there are any number of artists, and I'm not going to name them now, but any number of artists who I think their work would just look absolutely spectacular in any of those spaces. And, you know, for example, the dining hall. Um, uh, well, okay, I'll name one artist. I'm envisioning, and forgive me, but Pamela. Uh, I'm envisioning a, an installation by Jorge Pardo of, uh, of glass blown lamps, you know, hanging from the ceiling, hundreds of colored glass. Uh, blown, hand-blown lamps. Um, Sarah Z, uh, an alum of Yale, uh, who makes sculptures that look like exploded um, objects. You know, her work would look fabulous in the stairwell. Um, so I love the way the colleges look, and I think the renovation was just absolutely spectacular. So yes, um, I think that, that, you know, some work works better in some spaces than others. There also are a lot of portraits that hang in um, in Ezra, Ezra and Morse, um, in the head of colleges' homes in particular, you know, are the portraits of Ezra and I think his wife. <laughs> um, the one of him really stands out. Uh, so yeah, I mean, the work, because it's, it, it actually could be recreated in a, another space. So in that sense, it's not strictly site-specific, but it was conceived for that space. Thank you. There's so many things to think about in what you've said, um, but I'm still thinking about Frank Bowling talking about American painting in a British way, something I try to do quite a lot. And I'd love to know then, when you talk about abstract painting and when you paint abstract painting, are you inhabiting a national space? Um, is American abstract painting different from abstract painting in Italy? Britain, and, or is it the discourse around it? And then within that, is African-American abstract painting a space within American painting or a space within global painting? In other words, what's, what does nation, where does nation feed into an abstraction? Where do they meet? This was one of my uh, graduate exam questions, so this is really a question. <laughs> this, is a, this is really, this is open to the rest of you. Well, uh, I'll address one small part of that. I would suggest to you, um, and I will quote the editor of our book, um, that 
<laughs> race is a very bad lens through which to view art. Art is art, abstraction is abstraction. It should be judged based on the merits of what it is, who made it, well always, any work of art has the signature of the maker in it. Um, but you have to evaluate the art as a standalone phenomenon. You know, Tim, I, I want to answer that question in some ways because I think you already know what I think about this. But I, I do think that it is important as we sit here in an institution that is in many ways quite devoted to a certain uh, nationalism, but it is also just as devoted to expanding what that may have once been to now be something else. Um, I think that it is important to see Frank Bowling as British, but I also think that it is important to understand his immigrant status uh, in New York, and specifically New York. He, he, would, he did not go to the rest of the country in that way. But I also think that I thought it was very interesting that Bill described him as South American. Um, and that was, that's quite telling for me because I immediately wanted to say to Bill, but he is, you know, he was born in Guyana before independence. He was, he was from the empire. That mm -hmm. doesn't have, you know, that has a broad location. And yet we are all right in a way. It is important particularly in the way that the, that the modern and contemporary material in this building is understood to get the genesis of it. So we need to understand that someone like John Boylan had to fight against um, you know, essentially the imperialism of American abstract painting that was being brought to London and was being sort of superimposed onto a much longer tradition of abstract painting that already existed to then get to why someone like Frank Bowling felt that he needed to come to the States and that not only did he need to come to the States, he needed to go to New York and he needed to go around and meet people like Bill Williams and that they stayed in, in conversation has as much to do, I think, around, about why being British at that moment was both incredibly constitutive for him, so he was writing, I think you're absolutely right that he was writing about American art from this very British perspective, but I think he desperately wanted to be a part of second generation abstraction in that writing. So part of that was writing himself into the story that was happening with you all at the same time. Well, there were also, if, if you remember, if you think back, uh, John Walker came over at the same time there was an invasion of British artists at that point. Hockney. And Hockney. And uh, there was a slightly different attitude in the work. Um, in the case of, say, John Walker, there is a, a physicality and a kind of romanticism in, in the way he, he painted. And it seemed like the tradition that he was coming out of. I think Pam's idea, uh, when you put an overlay of race on work, you're stepping into a very difficult area uh, because there are nuances that have to be talked about. Uh, there are experiences that have to be talked about. And sometimes we kind of shortcut that. Um, abstraction is a home for artists all over the world. There is a form of abstraction that probably exists in every um, I, I just can't, you know, from New Zealand, they're abstract artists. And, and it, um, it allows us to enter a work of art and to be transformed. When you stand in front of a good abstract painting, there's no separation between you and the painting. You're not looking at something, you're experiencing that thing. And that's the most difficult thing to have people do in a museum is to experience a work of art as opposed to look at a work of art. Uh, if you've ever gone to the Met, uh, people spend about 10 seconds in front of something and then they move on. Well, that's, that's just the opposite of what my whole life is about. Um, I think painters and sculptors and artists are trying to get you to slow down just a little bit and experience something, as opposed to look at something and categorize it. You know, it's almost like you, you, know, you have to get through this and you have to have 52 names. Um, it reminds me, you know, when you send young high school, or junior high school kids to the museum, and you give them a list of what they have to see, and you say, well, you know, come back with 25 names, and they get the 25 names in 25 minutes. 
and they fulfill the assignment, but you miss the essential thing, the reason you're sending them to the museum, which is to have this experience that's outside of what they normally do and what they normally are engaged in. Uh, for me, it's as a museum, how do you slow people down? How do you get them to experience something? Because it's that experience for me when I was very young that transformed me and probably allowed me to become an artist. Uh, and aside, I went to high school on 51st and Lexington Avenue. The Museum of Modern Art was on 54th, just off 5th. So we're, we're talking about five blocks between those two experiences. Uh, the Museum of Modern Art became an extension of our classrooms because we were taken there constantly and taken there to the Met as well. And I think the more we can get young people into the museums, uh, the better. And what I mean by that is physically get them into the museum and have them spend time with the object. It's not necessarily for them to know the, the, who the artist is, the date that it was made, what period it's from. It's just to have an experience with objects. And you know, the wonderful thing about the Yale Art Gallery uh, is it's free here which is very different than going to the Met when you have to pay 18 bucks or the modern or whatever it is. Uh, it's a free institution. The question is how do you get the audience? How do you develop this new audience? Uh, that's, the, 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 um, uh, uh, that's what's going to save my life and my experience and the 50 years that I've put into being an artist is that new audience. I'm sorry, I'm no, Bill, going off. You, <laughs> as, you know, as usual, Bill, Bill gives us the message. Um, I, I want to invite everyone here to um, continue this conversation, but let's do so outside um, on the second floor in the reception ah. that the center has um, well, graciously provided with us exist. along with the president and the we're, we're, president's we're, wife's office. Um, I want to thank the Yale Center for British Art I would like to thank um, President Salovey um, and Dr. Um, his wife. And I would also uh, like to thank you all for coming and listening to us tonight. Thank you. <laughs>